Hi everybody, uh, thanks for joining us. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. Um, I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com, so information services, resources, and so on, for people who work in and around the global medcoms community, by which I mean people who work in and around medical communications, medical education, medical publishing, um, and the associated businesses. Um, and importantly, um, a whole bunch of services for people who are interested in learning more about working in medcoms, either as a medical writer, account manager, and so on. Um, so you'll find lots and lots of information at medcomsnetworking.com or specifically for instance at Network Pharma TV where there's now 400 odd videos um, and specifically if you're interested in joining the business at firstmedcomsjob.com so there's plenty to go and have a look at. What I'm doing at the moment is having a chat with some of the people who work in and around Medcoms um, which is interesting to hear about their personal insights um, and what they're doing and today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Vicky. Um, so Vicky I'm going to let you introduce yourself a little bit of background as to where you came from and how you got into Medcoms. Over to sure. you. Sure. Thanks, Peter. It's really great to be here. Lovely to chat to you. Um, so I'm Vicky Sherwood. I am now a team lead in Big Pharma for Scientific Writing Group. Um, and scientific writing in, in pharma is basically medical communications, essentially. Um, it, it, the nomenclature, I think, of scientific writing, can, of medical writing, can be a little bit confusing. Um, so in pharma, we tend to refer to medical writers as regulatory uh, writers. Whereas uh, scientific writers in pharma, they tend to be uh, med medcoms writers, uh, writing med ed and publications and those types of things, which is what my background is. So I got into medical writing, gosh, about just over six years ago now. And um, I spent 30 years being uh, my, my life really, and then becoming a scientist, not knowing anything about medical writing. I didn't even know it existed. Um, I was a career academic. I was running my own team, my own group. I was a group leader, University of Dundee. We were doing skin cancer research. Um, but I was always one of those scientists who really enjoyed talking about science. I liked putting the slides together, going to congresses. I loved talking about it. I loved writing up the publications. Um, even more so, I'd say, than the research itself. When I look back as a PhD student, I even enjoyed writing my thesis to some degree. All my peers absolutely were hating it at the time. And I was thinking, oh, I, don't, I don't actually mind it that much. So in hindsight, I think I always had this natural tendency for communications in me. Um, and it got to a point in academia where, you know, it, it was a struggle in terms of funding and keeping the salaries going in the lab. And I just thought to myself, do I want to be doing this for the next 30 years of my career? Um, at the time, I probably had at least three decades worth of work um, ahead of me. So I had a bit of a, I guess, uh, a question about my career progression and where I was going, um, which I think a lot of people do, you know, when they when they get to that, that kind of point halfway through. Um, well, actually, I was just under halfway through. So I was I was starting to think, what else could I do? And given that we were doing skin cancer research, we had a translational edge to the work we were doing. I always thought that moving into like pharma or maybe medical devices, some kind of life science area would be really interesting. So what I did was I hit LinkedIn and I started talking to people who were working in bioscience and biopharma. And I spoke to all kinds of people. It was really interesting. I spoke to people working in R&D. I spoke to people working in commercial and sales, medical affairs, um, even recruitment. I spoke to all kinds of people working there. And just serendipitously, I ended up speaking to a medical writer, uh, somebody working in medcoms. And she was explaining to me what she did. Uh, you know, she wrote publications, she wrote Congress materials, standalone scientific meetings, all these types of things. And it was really like a bit of an epiphany. I was like, oh, wow, there's a job out there. There's the science I like doing. It's well paid, gives great flexibility. And all the things she was saying, I, I was really excited by. So I remember talking to her, I think it was like in my lunch break. And that evening I hit LinkedIn. I found more people doing that kind of job. I did a bit of research. I actually pretty soon came across your, your website, Peter, and right. um, started looking at that. It was really, really useful at the time. Thank you so much. Um, and I think I attended one of your events as well in Manchester. So this was obviously pre-pandemic. Everything was still live. Um, and I met agency representatives there. Um, and uh, through that networking, I ended up talking to people within the, the agencies that interested me the most, um, people that could actually, you know, change my future right, and, and get me a job. So I ended up submitting my CV and talking to those people. And uh, yeah, the rest was history. I got hired uh, by Envision Pharma 
uh, went moved down from Scotland to London to work in their office in Hammersmith. Had a fantastic grounding in medcoms. I uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, then I went to work for another agency. Um, and then I ended up moving to Ireland for personal reasons, husband's job. Right. Um, and the great thing about medcoms is if, if that happens to you, if you have to move geographical location or whatever, you can always fall back on freelancing. So that kind of flexibility was, was great for us. Uh, so I freelanced for a bit of 2020 uh, while I found my feet and realized, you know, what the job market was like in medcoms in Ireland. Uh, and then I found that uh, Novartis were actually hiring um, pharma company. They were also hiring uh, medcoms writers. So I moved over to Novartis and I'm still there. And I just want to say, actually, um, everything I say today is is to, is on my own uh, back, not okay, to do right. with Novartis directly, but I do I do work for them. Okay, okay, okay. So just just before we go any further, just just out of interest, have you got just a little bit of reflection on going from academia after what was a reasonable amount of time? Um, mm. A lot of people worry when they're in academia that they go a bit too far and they can't make the change. So, have you got any reflection on that in terms of moving from academia into a medcom type environment a little bit later on down your sort of postdoc career? Yeah, it, it, it was really interesting. And of course, I had those fears, right? I, I was full of self-doubt. I thought, you know, my entire network at the time was academic. My Most of my working life had been in academia. I didn't know how translatable my skills were to industry. And was I going to be viewed as too old uh, or, or too, too, too overqualified, too senior? Um, and so I kind of had to talk to people and just kind of overcome those barriers in a way because I did get asked those questions at interview I did get asked um you know you will be starting this you'll have to come in learn that are you okay right. with that and I had to approach it with a bit of humility of course right. I needed to learn something new and it is a different type of writing you know of course I could write scientific papers I've done it for 15 years or so um but the, the, the way in which you write and the approach and the process you use in medcoms is very different. And of course, I had to learn all that. Um, and I just, you know, it was just so happened that I, I worked with a really talented bunch in vision, it's fantastic. And they gave me fantastic grounding um, in how to approach all that. So uh, yeah, I got lucky. But, but yes, it, it, you know, it was different and it was a jump. What I would say is though, I think I haven't wasted all that experience those years right. so if you are right. coming to this and you've done several postdocs or whatever and you've been a long time in academia I have been able to capitalize on that uh, and I do think my career has flown in medcoms um, and I think part of that because I was able to draw on that experience so it, it's you know experience is never lost I should say right right <laughs> right and it's all about those transferable skills isn't it that you're building up the project management and, and, and so on and exactly multidisciplinary yeah. team working all those sorts of things which um which is so important um, and again the same sort of question then because that's a that's a big jump then from the sort of agency type environment into into big pharma so mm -hmm. again observations thoughts about making that jump yeah so that's that's an interesting one i mean I, I still do medcoms i still do the job that i did in agency yeah, yeah, of course yeah, now yeah. i'm in a setting of you know a multinational pharma company it's a much bigger organization there's you know hundreds of thousands of people working worldwide in the company i work in um so whilst what we do and the core work that we do is the same we have the perspective of you know how to bring a pharma product to market um, and that's quite interesting to have those kind of insights um, the way we're set up we are like an in-house agency we support the wider business um, right. so there's a lot of fam familiarity from my agency days and, and what I brought from agency is very similar uh, but of course we have that additional perspective um, and you know a pharma company their main thing is to develop, manufacture, and bring products to market and be able to sell them in, in different markets globally. So that's their focus. And we, we support that function very much in the same way as a third party provider would as an agency. Right, so there's right. lots of similarities uh, as well to what I do. Sure, sure, sure. But it's a very different, bigger corporate environment, which, yes. which has implications yeah. yeah um so just that so okay so that's the, the medical writing side of it and, and you've got a lot of experience there from a number of different sort of sides of the business as it were and um, i know one of the things and people maybe watching this will know about you as the, um, the the biomed badass uh your blogging um talk a little bit about that i mean what's what's the motivation behind it what what do you in, get involved in and yeah how does that work 
Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So maybe maybe some of your your viewers do know my my work, my website on that. So basically, when I when I broke into medcoms, a lot of folks, particularly at Dundee, actually reached out to me and said a lot of students, a lot of postdocs, oh, we see you've made this transition. What are you doing? Right. Um, and they just came with the same sorts of questions. Um, what's it like? Uh, how do you find it? Rele you know, is it relevant uh, to what you were doing in academia? How, how transferable are your skills? And these sorts of questions kept coming up. Um, and, and then other people were reaching out to me on LinkedIn as well, I think, from my wider academic community or network that I had, asking the same questions. So I thought, I'm just answering the same questions here. I'm going to answer these questions on a blog. Um, so I just set up a web page. I, I put a blog together. And it's just kind of grown organically from there. I talk about academic to industry career transitions more generally but given my background of course I focus on pharma careers I focus on medical and scientific writing mostly um, just because that's you know that's where I can give most expertise and so yeah it's just really grown from there and uh, yeah it's a really engaged community so if right. anybody's interested in pharma careers scientific writing transitions from academia to industry you know you can sign up um, I send out a regular newsletter through the blog. You can sign up at www.biomedbadass.com forward slash subscribe. Right. Uh, maybe we could put that link in, in this yeah, below. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so you'll, you'll get regular updates. And I, I basically talk a lot about you know, how to make that break into industry, which can be a challenging step for some people, as I found it myself, as I spoke about earlier. Um, it can be quite daunting and there's work to be done when you want to make that transition. It, essentially, it's a career switch. Um, exactly. So you have to put in a bit of a bit of effort and in investment in talking to people and learning new things. I, I guess my, my argument for, um, in terms of what I do and thinking back to my start in life, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the opportunity now is for people who are wanting to make those transitions to learn so much more and get so much insight, you know, whether it's reading or watching videos or whatever. You know, there is no excuse now for people not to have some understanding <laughs> of the business, frankly, certainly in a yeah. business like ours, because several of us are doing quite a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And you can research the business, you can research the company, you can research the individual that's going to interview you sort of thing. Um, it's interesting you've mentioned LinkedIn quite a few times. I, I talked to a number mm -hmm. of academics who are really quite sort of like, do I, you know, I don't want to be part of LinkedIn sort of thing. But um, just out of interest, I'm throwing this at you, but just out of interest, I mean, I would always say to people, get yourself on LinkedIn and and, 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 and network and use the opportunity and reach out because actually we're all quite friendly people, even if we're quite busy. And actually reaching out on LinkedIn can, can come up with the sorts of stories you've said. I mean, you're nodding and, and are we just agreeing with each other on that, that one? That's a, that's a good message to put out there sort of thing. Yeah, no, I mean, I couldn't agree more. LinkedIn was literally my savior. When I came to right. that point in my academic career, and as I said, I had no network beyond academia. LinkedIn was the place I could find people. It was the one source. And actually, seven years ago, when I was thinking about this, there weren't as many resources out there. You were out there, thank goodness, Peter. Um, but there weren't as many of these yeah. kind of blogs yeah. and discussion groups. There's a lot of talk about this on social media. So it, it was a little bit more challenging I think to find that information back then thank goodness we've moved forward but even so I was pleasantly surprised just how many people on LinkedIn were willing to give me 15 minutes of yeah. their time yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was it was it was great again it can be sort of a bit scary I think but um but yeah we're a friendly bunch and we are you know as I say we're busy but we're a friendly bunch and and don't be afraid of reaching out to to anybody sort of thing um just just to sort of wrap this up a little bit and just follow this line of thought a little bit and you know you're doing a lot to advise people and, and, and offer information to people who are interested let's let's specifically talk about the medical writing side you know what sort of just a couple of tips that you would give people um, and, and, and may, a couple of tips. And um, I know sort of the medical writing test is always the big thing that people worry a little bit about. Have you just got a couple of things that you can say to people and, 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 and sort of reassure them slightly and a bit of advice to sort of sure. finish the, the yeah. check on? Yeah, I, I absolutely understand where they're coming from. I remember when the first, the first mention of medical writing test came to me, I was like, what is that test? What is it going to involve? You know, I was hitting Google, like, are there any sample tests? And there was surprisingly <laughs> little out there. So I think not. just the word <laughs> test is enough to frighten people, right? Um, and actually, serendipitously, I, I've ended up doing a lot of tests myself through my career so far, obviously, as a writer. Uh, but now I'm in a hiring manager position in pharma, and I mark a lot of the tests. So I see the other perspective as well. So I've got, right. I've got a good grounding now of what makes a good test. Um, 
And, and so I would first say, you know, don't panic. If you're new to medical writing, if you're an aspiring medical writer and you get hit with a test in part of the hiring process, it's completely normal, okay? You, you, you're gonna have to do these. Um, just get used to it, don't get overwhelmed. The materials they give you, you know, read them carefully and then go in with three specific questions, okay? Because usually you're given a study or you're given tables, data tables from a study. Ask yourself, Firstly, why did they do the study? Okay, right. what, what is it? Why, why the reason? What is the knowledge gap that they're trying to fill? The second thing you need to think about is how they did that study. What was the main methodology that was used? Because you're going to have to explain that. And then the third thing is, what did they find? And so what did they find is the primary results, okay? The, the, the primary findings from the study. There's usually lots of sub-studies and secondary analyses and things like that. You need to get across that primary uh, data, usually efficacy and safety data, really. Um, and then once you've grasped that, you can then put it into the format that they've asked for. It could be an abstract, could be some kind of a summary introduction, could be um, a slide deck. Um, I've even heard people being asked to do a poster, which uh, seems quite a lot of work to do for, for a writing test, but they obviously yeah. exist. So whatever format it is, you know, you need to get that, those questions in there, that kind of uh, why, how and what question. Um, and then, you know, in terms of how you lay it out, just think about, you know, the clarity of it, um, QC it, make sure the data is correct, um, and think about sentence structure and flow and, and how that story kind of builds of how you're telling those kind of three, you know, um, 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 how, um, sorry, what was I saying? How, what and why. Um, exactly, yeah. So yeah. just think about how to structure that and that flow. Because when the hiring manager is reading it, what they're asking themselves is, um, how much training am I gonna have to give this people? But crucially, relevant to how much experience they have. So if you're coming in as, as an aspiring medical writer, they know they're going to have to provide some training to you to get you up to, to where you need to be, to be a medical or senior medical writer within their organization. Um, but equally so, if you're coming in at a higher level and you're doing a, the same test, you know, the hiring manager is thinking, you know, I, I'm obviously not going to hire somebody at a principal medical writer level that I have to train a lot. So they're asking their question, you know, how much kind of do you understand and um, how much training am I going to have to put in? So definitely make sure that the data is correct. That's the most crucial thing um, and that you're structuring it in a way that's clear, concise um, and, and gives a strong message. It's compelling in a way. All right, okay, okay. And the two the two things I say to people, I must admit, um, and I'm I'm not a writer and so but the two things that seem important to me is one, it's worth saying that in my experience anyway, but would you agree with this? People aren't trying to catch people out. So, you know, read the brief as it were. They'll mm -hmm. tell you what they want and then do what they want, sort of thing. They're not trying to catch you out. And then the old sort of attention to detail is just absolutely everyone's just got to keep saying attention to detail, attention to detail, you know, double check it, like you've been saying, QC and so on check that the data is right but also check that you've spelled the names right and that those sorts yes. of things and it, take a moment <laughs> to read and think attention to detail is unbelievably important okay look absolutely fantastic i know we go loads further with all of this um, and, and we haven't got the time to do it but i know also that i can say from from your point of view you're very happy for people to reach out via linkedin for instance i keep yeah. saying that's really quite important but also the biomad biomedbadass.com uh, uh blog is is a great way of contacting you and getting some of the resources so mm -hmm. i'm going to say a huge thank you for for joining us it's fascinating to hear these personal stories from people thank you very much for joining us i just ask give a little wave and we'll say goodbye to everybody so bye bye <laughs>